Good evening, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to all you sitting here in the grass at Mastership Rights. Very nice to see you. Can I hear, have a little cheer and a wave? Um, and can you now wave to the camera? I'm going to say hello to all of those online watching from afar. <laughs> the two audiences meet. Um, thank you very, very much. My name is Sam Lee. I'm going to sing you a song. These words were composed by Spencer the Rover, who traveled most parts of Great Britain and Wales. He had been so reduced, which caused great confusion. And that was the reason he went on the road. In Yorkshire near Rotherham, he had been on his rambles, being weary of traveling, he sat himself down at the foot of yonder mountain, there runs a clear fountain with bread and cool water. He himself did refresh, and it tasted more sweeter than the gold he had squandered, more sweeter than honey and gave more content. But the thoughts of his babies lamenting their father brought tears to his eyes and made him lament. Well, the night fast approaching to the woods he resorted with wood bine and ivy his bed for to make there he dreamt about crying lamenting and sighing go home to your family and your rambling Forsake. On the 5th of November, I've a reason to remember when first he arrived at his family's front door. Well, they looked so surprised when first he arrived to behold such a stranger. Once more in their sight, and his children came around him with their brittle prattling stories, with their brittle prattling stories to drive care away. Now they are united like birds of one feather. Like bees in one hive, contented they'll be, contented they'll be, and go rambling no more. That is the song of Spencer the Rover. No, hold your claps. We are now in the forest. <laughs> we are in the Deptford Forest. We actually have real trees. But I'd like you to take yourself into the ancient forest from where that song came from, where we are going tonight. 
a land and a place of great mystery and intrigue, of ancientness, of deep song, of bird choruses that come with the dawn and go with the night. A place where songs like that, Spencer the Rover, are from. A song there that speaks of a time gone by of a man going through something that we all go through at some point maybe in our lives, many of us, a time of great pain and agony. Spencer speaks in that song of being reduced and confused, and that is old language for being a man suffering from mental depression. And there he is on the road, itinerant, lost, wandering, squandered his gold and riches, left his family behind, and somewhere by a mountain, by a clear spring, by a forest, he receives the message as he is taken into the woods by night, wrapped in woodbine and ivy and going on the shamanic journey, the purge of his ills. And this voice says, go home to your family and your ramblings forsake. And I don't know whose voice that is. Maybe it's his God's voice. Maybe it's his inner consciousness voice. Maybe it's the voice of the forest itself telling him to return. The song is about the nature cure, and it's also about the returning, that calling back to home, and that's what we're gathered here for tonight, to tell that story of all those of us who are being called to places of sanctuary, to the fireside, and all those species that are migrating their way back to these lands, their homelands, their birthplace. And so um, thank you for going with us on this rather strange journey. This is gonna be an unusual evening for everyone, for you guys who come dressed really warm, I'm pleased, and if you're not, get by the fire. And for those of you at home who are joining us online around the world, I know we've got listeners in from far-flung places, lands that never see nightingales. Um, very pleased to have you here. Um, so I'm Sam Lee, and um, tonight we are going to be in honor of that bird and we're going to be calling him in. And I say him because it's the males that sing. Um, and I'd like to, just those of you who are here, just say a few things about how this has been put together, how you're hearing these sounds in this amazing 10.2 sound surround sound system. Um, thanks to Sounding Wild, the amazing sound recording, nature recording organization who are traveling the world, capturing the choruses of endangered species um, from up here in England all the way down to, to Cape Town and monitoring the amazing sound worlds that are at threat. Um, so they are part of the production, also put on by the Nest Collective. And we are hosting this. We are hosting this in association with Sing With Nightingales. We're out in the forest every night from here till the end of May with audiences like yourselves welcoming to them into the forest to come and listen to the birds in real time, in real life, and playing music with them. And so um, this is the theater version. For those, if you can't get Muhammad to the mountain, you have to bring the mountain to Muhammad, right? So here we are bringing the Nightingale to you live through some technology. And I'm going to tell you a bit about that in a moment. But for your sake, the way this is going to happen is we're going to have the theater show. There's going to be an interval. You can help yourself at any time to hot drinks and soup, and alcohol, and books and CDs, what I have made. <laughs> um, please uh, go at any time you feel you need to stretch. Um, and for those of you at home, you can also help yourself to the drinks cabin at any time you like. Um, and we are really grateful for you being here. For those online, I'd just like to say thank you very much. If you're enjoying this experience, um, then please, you can support The Nest through the links online and uh, your donations supporting this uh, live event is very grateful, welcomely received. Um, so after our interval, which we have a little treat for you guys, we then have the second section, and later on we will be waiting for the call for, of the Nightingale, and then we will be dialing him in into the speakers so that we can all hear the bird live coming from the Sussex Forest. More on that shortly. But we're not going to be doing it alone. I'm very pleased to say I have some wonderful musicians uh, who have created 
the music, and that will be combined with the live broadcast uh, coming later. And their names are, I'm going to say them now, because there's not going to be a chance later to introduce them one by one, and, and in no particular order. But we have music that has been sent from across the world, including Janavi Harrison, the wonderful Indian songstress uh, from the US. We have Tenzin Choigal, the Grammy Award, uh, playing Tibetan based in Australia um, with Tibetan music. We have Masa Vadat uh, from Iran. We have Mari Kalkun from Estonia. We have Gabriel Prokofiev from London. We have Moira Smiley from the US and the Bowerbird Collective with Anthony Albrecht from Australia as well. So musicians from across the planet have created music specially to be played in celebration of the Nightingale song. And that's going to be way into the dark because we're all half asleep lying in the grass or, or in our beds. And I want you to close your eyes at this point and enter into a, 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 a sort of a state of semi-consciousness and float off into the high canopies of the branches. But we are not going to uh, be just with them. We have two other wonderful musicians who I'd like you to kind of wiggle your fingers as they enter on stage. Because uh, joining me here on the stage, we have Anna Phoebe and Harry Christellis. Please welcome them on. Harry and Phoebe, come and join me. <laughs> All right, go on, have a little applause. But that's your lot. <laughs> so you're hearing the springtime evening chorus that's not live. This was pre-recorded only a couple of days ago, coming from our secret location where the Nightingales are down in Sussex, just north of Lewis. Um, who here has heard the Nightingale song before in real life? Wave your hands. Quite a few of you, good. So he's coming later, but this is true Sussex 2022 springtime evening chorus. And it's going to be playing and it's going to be dying away with the night as it goes. So what you're hearing is real time. Um, Hello, Anna. Hello, Harry. Thank you for joining. We, do you fancy a song? We're going to sing you the anthem that is Birds in the Spring. This is another song from the Copper family, the first song, Spencer the Rover, from Sussex. These are all Sussex songs here, um, from the Copper family of Rotting Dean and Peacehaven. And uh, this is the hymn to bird song. So it um, goes a little bit like this. chance for to roam as I walk through the valleys by the side of the grove it is there I did hear those charming but sing Did you ever hear so sweet Did you ever hear so sweet Did you ever hear so sweet 
the birds in the spring. As I sat myself down to view all around and the song of the nightingale why echoed all around why his notes were so charming his voice so sincere no music no song no music, no song star. No music, no song star. And with him, Why listen, draw near That when you've grown old You'll have this to say That you never heard so sweet So sweet that you never heard so sweet as the birds in the spring. <laughs> thank you, Anna. Thank you, Harry. Um, the nightingale, the principal bird, as the coppers sing. Um, his voice was so gorgeous, so sincere. No music, no songster with him can compare. And so it is that the nightingale is a, is a bird whose voice has been revered across this country and indeed across the whole of the Northern Hemisphere from as far west as East Devon, where they inhabit to their very limits, and all the way to the east that is Western Mongolia. And in that enormous amount of landmass, millions of nightingales spend their summers meeting, mating, brooding, nesting, egging, laying, learning their songs, learning their nature, and then flying the, for us, 4,800 kilometers that it is from southern England all the way down to sub-Saharan Africa. And this mighty uh, journey is done twice a year with this extraordinary knowing of how to get there. But this event 
comes as part of a, uh, a recognition, a celebration of a relationship that the United Kingdom has had with the bird, um, maybe more recently than the thousands of years that we've been singing and telling songs and more about that very soon. It was a very uh, important event that occurred here um, from Surrey in 1924. It's been in the news lately through the, uh, the music and playing of Beatrice Harrison one of the world's greatest cellists that ever was, the muse of Elgar, a great society figure. And I bring her in because she was the one who brought nightingales back to popular attention and in whose footsteps tonight we are walking. Um, there's been some dispute lately on the, uh, the, tr the, the kind of truthfulness of whether this key moment on the 19th of May in 1924 indeed really happened as, as was claimed. That the BBC made a very important leap from doing all their broadcasting from inside the studio at Broadcasting House to becoming an outdoor live broadcasting uh, entity. Now that sounds like a very small leap technologically, but actually we're talking at a time where the wireless radio was very new and was the state of the arts. This was like kind of beyond anything we can imagine right now. It's like when we first got mobile phones, this is what it was like having uh, wireless radio, entertainment brought into your, into your home. In many ways, it signaled the death knell of the oral tradition. Um, and uh, folk songs were certainly put into great peril at this time, because mass culture could suddenly move about and be listened everywhere. And Beatrice Harrison, who was the, the, the sort of great society fish, she was the campaigner for women's lib, she was friends with royalty, she traveled the world playing her cello, and uh, when she moved into Surrey with her family, she discovered that in her back garden, as was often the case in southern England in the 20s, there were nightingales living in her home. This was a time when there were hundreds of thousands of nightingales across the southeast of England. And she used to go on nights like this that were perhaps a little bit warmer and less windy, that she would go into her garden and she'd play her cella, as she called it, her cella with the nightingale. And... Um, one day, while doing a you know, casual gig at the Albert Hall, she met Lord Reith, who was then controller of the BBC, and says to uh, Lord Reith, um, I've got this cello and nightingale thing going on. The, the, the nightingale loves my instrument. Why don't you come and record it? Anyway, he, Lord Reith thought this was an absurd idea and was best left ignored. Um, however, some of, the, uh, some of the technicians at the BBC at the time had been creating these new extraordinary microphones and battery packs that could fit into the back of a van. They were so small. And uh, all sorts of newfangled kit and technology. And indeed, he was convinced that this was a really great way of testing out live broadcasting from outside the studio. And so it was arranged to be on the 18th of May. Uh, they went out into her back garden and un unwound over a mile of cable from the local telephone exchange and um, into her back garden. And they waited for the nightingale and they waited and they waited and no nightingale sang. I'm feeling that sensation again tonight. <laughs> Will they sing? So they had flexible schedules in those days. So they went back again on the 19th of May and uh, did the whole set up once again and waited and then at around 9 p.m. Um, in the middle of another broadcast that was happening of a concert somewhere else, somehow, I have no idea, they broke off to say, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very important announcement. We have a live Nightingale with Beatrice Harrington coming. And this caught the public attention and they listened in as Beatrice played the Chant Hindu, she played uh, the Irish traditional Danny Boy or the Londonderry Air it was known as, and some improvisations. And this playing with the bird was listened to across the world, the BBC broadcast across the world, and those in further flung, pl flung places that couldn't hear it were treated to family members in the UK putting their telephone receivers to the wireless and telephoning the song so that people could hear the nightingale. And it was a sensation. Millions listened in. 50,000 letters poured into the BBC um, to speak about how much they adored hearing the nightingale. And so on for every year, for the next several years until 1944, this same broadcast was repeated. And it became a national day of celebration when they broadcast the nightingales. 
we're kind of doing the same thing a little bit, but um, what we have is, uh, is technology that is out in the woods in Sussex um, that with uh, one of our team manning that um, satellite transmission unit with big air and black block box and uh, a mobile phone. And he is out in the woods. We're going to contact him very soon and get in touch with him. He's, his name is Tiff, Tiff Weir. And he's been down in the, with the, ca the Nightingale camp with us all uh, this month and next month. And when, uh, when the Nightingales start singing, they don't start singing till well into dark darkness. They're a nighttime song. This song that we're waiting for, this is their mating song. The males are singing it up to the females that are migrating over. And, um, and he's going to be sending us with his boom mics um, the song which we're going to play out of this surround sound system. And although the Nightingale can't hit us on this particular occasion, unlike most of the time, we get to play the music with the birds and we are hearing them in high fidelity, perhaps even better than we could in the wood. Um, so more on that later. I'm just checking where we're at, um, that we're all on schedule. Um, and that's kind of, so that's kind of how it's gonna work tonight. Um, we're honoring Beatrice. Her 100 years is coming up in a couple of years. The, uh, the actual evidence to prove that they faked the nightingale and they used a siffleur, which is a whistler, a bird impersonating whistler, is actually slightly inaccurate because the, they didn't record, that we weren't in the habit of recording broadcasts in those days, so we don't actually have the document of that first one. So we'll never really know. But I ask, does it matter? No. We're so like hung up with, is it true, is it false? all this fake news here, and actually, it's a piece of art, as this is as well. And so, you know, whatever happened then, it inspired many people to fall in love with nightingales, and that's what we're gonna do tonight. So, it's, a, it's gonna be a long, windy, cold night getting ready for that nightingale song. If you don't know the person next to you yet, I'd get to know them, because their body warmth might prove very useful soon. And what I hope is that you lot at the very back are going to slowly migrate further forward and we're going to be like penguins huddled up. <laughs> um, are you up for that? Great, yeah, please just like, just don't even ask their name, just put your arm around them. That's what I say. Just go, is it okay? And then, yeah, get in their jacket. Um, and those of you who were listening online, you made a really good choice. Okay. <laughs> I think it's time that I hand it over to Harry right now. Wonderful North London musician, and uh, we're gonna indulge in a bit of pure Harry Christellis.
the nightingale is a small bird, brown to, to look at, slightly lighter chest. They, um, they're no bigger than a robin. Tiny things and uh, have put all their energy into their song, all their splendor uh, into their voices. They're very shy birds. Um, very hard to be seen. They live in dense, scrubby thicket, blackthorn bushes surrounded by brambles and dense, uh, dense thorn to protect them because they're ground nesting birds or just above the ground and they spend their lives in these kind of blisters on the landscape that we think of in the kind of the wasteland you see by railways, those sort of wonderful wild nether regions that uh, humans have sort of left uh, to go to waste. It's one of their favorite places, as well as the um, incredibly dense, um, sort of verdant uh, foliage of the coppice, the woods that are cut down and harvested on 30-year cycles that was once much of the coverage of this country in a time when we um, were in great need of large amounts of wood to keep our fires going, to warm our homes, to cook our food, to build our houses, to build our furniture and our instruments and our, uh, our tools. And when it, from a time when everything was really wood derived, um, we created vast coppice plantations. And in that space for thousands of years, nightingales have depended upon human beings to live uh, side by side with, with us. And um, it was thus that in these slightly warmer nights of spring, um, that when we were stepping out of our homes for the first time to take off our winter coats and rejoice in the coming in of new life, the nightingale was there as a harbinger of the spring. Really the, 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 the bird that sang through the night um, at the time where we were often in states of great celebration. And, and over these weeks, that we're in right now, we've just had Easter. We're coming up to May Day. This was a time marked in, with great ceremony and celebration and rituals. Um, the Easter uh, idea of rebirth goes back thousands of years. And it was a time where we celebrated in many ways our rebirth and our survival, coming from the, the depths of winter where our food supplies may have uh, really uh, run out and we were in the hungry gap. Um, the nutrients was finally arriving. This was a time of exquisite elation that we had made it through the hard winter. And the migrant species returning, although we didn't know they migrated, but the fat of the land returning um, was marked through many customs and ritualized behaviors that celebrated that uh, rejuvenation of life. And so it was across our land, these islands, and across Europe, uh, rituals were uh, enacted. We have the maypole traditions. Um, we have the the orgiastic behaviour that go in associate. All that ribbon stuff that was Victorian kind of uh, trying to sort of uh, hide the, the the deep sexualized roots of the maypole shaft that was a centre of fornication and and libation, much shunned upon by the church and banned. In fact, just across the river because we are. For those online, we're just by the River Thames, and you follow the river a little bit up to the to the city of London, and there is uh, the Gherkin, St Mary's Axe, uh, that famous building. You're thinking, why is he talking about that one? Well, the address of that is uh, just under the church of St Andrew's Undershaft, and Undershaft was the site of Europe's largest maypole. It's this enormous, enormous thing, and on the first of May, and around the first of May. Um, there was terrible, terrible London behavior. You think the sort of Leicester Square today times 10 with, you know, I, I, it was, you know, fight for, um, for not for children. And um, it was eventually cut down hundreds of years ago. But still, the church is called St. Andrew's Undershaft in honor of that maypole. And when Norman Foster was designing it, he wanted to honor that history. So he uh, mistakenly thought what well, these old maypoles were covered in ribbons, latticed, in that way that they'd become when you dance the maypole dance with little girls and boys and with pink ribbons. And so he designed the, uh, the gherkin with this lattice work to honor the, sh the, the patterns that the maypole makes. So there's wonderful ancient folk um, 
pales within that mighty glass building. And so it was that at this time of year, as we went and did that sort of business, um, the nightingales would sing through the night. They were London was full of them, as they are in Berlin still to this day. Berlin has 1,500 pairs at least every year returning and singing on the traffic lights and the, uh, the street lamps um, in Bergheim and all over the place as drunk, you know, techno, disco, club goers pour out at four o'clock in the morning or start their night at four o'clock in the morning, I don't know which. The nightingales are there singing down upon them. Uh, that was once the case in England. Um, indeed, Petticoat Lane Market just over there was a hotbed of nightingale selling and people would come and buy nightingales to take home in cages to sing them through the spring. Um, and they'd be, they'd be caught in the groves of Kent and shipped in every morning uh, to sell in Petticoat Lane Market. The nightingales were very much part of the London life. And um, if you imagine that this song that they sang uh, absolutely, resolutely for six whole weeks, seven whole weeks from the moment they arrived around the 10th, 12th of, May, of April through to the end of May. This song, for our entire history, would have been our soundtrack to the nighttime uh, experiences. And that has an epigenetic effect on us. And across Europe, the nightingale has become a bird deeply associated with sexual awakening, arousal, romance, uh, of that kind of exquisite joys of spring, separation as well, the idea of return when the birds stop singing, in fact, the idea that one day that song and one's love will return. So these birds are really deeply woven into our folklore and folk culture, as indeed they is testified within the numerous number of folk songs here and beyond, but more of that later. Um, because it's coming up May Day, and summer is on its way, right? <laughs> it felt like it yesterday, less so today. Um, I wanted to teach you one of these May songs, and I feel like I'm bending the tradition by singing this before the 1st of May. But has anyone here been down to Padstow in Cornwall for May Day? Some of you, scream out loud. Ah, well, if you're not around doing anything on May the 1st, um, head down for an extraordinary, ancient experience of the obios. And this is one of, those, um, one of those ceremonies that happens, like New Year's, Christmas, your birthday, all put together. It's that important a day. And in Cornwall, the, um, the, the anthem is the, uh, the nightingale, the song called the nightingale, which we're not going to sing, but it's such an important figure in Cornish, uh, in Cornish folklore, even though there are no nightingales left in Cornwall. Um, but we're going to teach you. I'm going to tee you up for singing a little bit. Great. The microphones aren't on the audience, so don't worry. You're not being broadcast. But I want to hear you loud and strong. So I'm going to teach you the Padstow May song as a way of calling in the summer. Um, so I'll just sing a line, and I'll give it to you, and then you sing it back with me. Is that all right? Is that all right? Yes, great. Um, so it goes like this. Unite and unite and let us all unite. Unite and unite and let us all unite. For summer is a coming today. For summer is a coming today. And with the we are going. And with the we are going, we will all unite. We will all unite in the merry morning of May. In the merry morning of May. Should we do that together? Unite and unite and let us all unite For summer is a coming today And with the we are going We will all unite in the merry morning of May If you sing really loudly, summer's going to come Unite and unite and let us all unite For summer is a-coming today And with the we 
we are going we will all unite in the merry morning oh may one more time unite and unite and let us all unite for summer is coming today and with the we are going we will all unite in the merry morning of may and so the padstonians will sing this song all day long with loads of different verses all these kind of crazy lines until the os this big black blanketed creature that's a kind of spirit horse i guess um that processes through the streets dies there in front of us and all the accordions and the drums and all the voices go quiet and somber as this horse dies and the only way of reviving the horse is to sing this strange lyric and tune which is part of the death and regeneration ritual that has happened for thousands of years and as it is sung the the os rises up and this is how that bit goes oh where is st george Oh, where is he? Oh, he's out in his longboat all on the salt sea. Oh, up flies the kite, down falls the lark. Oh, I'm Ursula bird would she had an old yow and she died in her own arco. and then the os team shout out os os and the whole crowd respond with we os Are you up for it os os we os let's sing it Unite and unite and let us all unite for summer is a coming today and with the we are going we will all unite in the merry morning of May Unite and unite and let us all unite for summer is coming today and with the we are going we will all unite in the merry morning of May beautifully sung thank you so much uh, you guys at home I hope you were singing along too um, and as well as these guys, thank you very much. Um, the May Day uh, tradition, although somewhat depleted, we only have a few different rituals that still survive. The Padstow Os, the Minehead Os, some well dressing, some, uh, some strange um, floral processions that we do, um, particularly strong in Cornwall. I don't know why they've kept it going really well. Uh, but this happens across Europe. May Day is a really important place, a festival of, of giving books to people, of flowers, and it's still a public holiday, always on May the 1st. Here we do it the nearest Monday, because we don't care about it that much. But in Europe, they, they hold strong to the, the, the day of workers, and it's a day of, uh, of people power. And um, the Nightingale features in uh, the kind of in many different guises, in many different characters all around Europe. Indeed, they are the nightingale. The nightingale is the national bird of Ukraine. Um, it's a very important bird, features in so many of their folk songs, still sung today. And no doubt the nightingales will be returning there around now to a very different scene. Um, it's also the bird imprinted on the Slovakian coin. Um, it's that important. But there is a few places where I, I, I want to tell you the amazing power of the nightingale in the culture. Obviously, we have in Persian poetry so much adoration of the, of the, the bird that presses uh, her breast, usually, because it was long thought that it was the females that sang. Into the thorn of the rose, he, was so, he or she was so in love with the rose that they'd press their 
their, their breast and pierce their own heart uh, in, in lament and mel melancholy. Um, in Afghanistan, the players of the rhubarb, which is a national instrument there, a beautiful kind of sympathetically stringed, a little bit like the sitar, um, the rhubarb players would go out into the groves, into the mulberry and, and fig groves, and would sit there under the nightingales playing their instruments. And the mark of a true master was one who could cool down the nightingale to land upon the tuning pegs of their instrument. And the, the birds would sing in conversation with those musicians. Um, if you head a little bit further west into the mountains of Ypres in northern Greece, just below the border of northern Macedonia, um, uh, a culture there that has remained unchanged for 8,000 years, mostly as a result of the valleys being so deep and impenetrable that all the warring nations that have passed through over the, the epochs have somewhat not bothered to try and conquer the Iperian folk. And their music dates back, we've uh, evident, over 8,000 years. And there the, the young shepherds would be taught how to play their skaros, their, their, their shepherding music that would be played to the sheep and goats as a way of calming them throughout the year from the wolves and the bears that would come and predate on those deep mountainsides. They would learn their tunes that were played on old, uh, old flutes made of reeds or, or willows, um, hollowed out willows, and indeed on bone flutes too, made out of the femurs of mute swans and the griffin vulture. Um, and the tunes would be learned by going to the nightingale's habitat and imitating the song. That's how they'd learn their technique. And that tradition within the Skaros would then be brought into the, um, into the villages for the ceremonies, the feasting weekends that would happen uh, on the weekends of August and September in celebration more latterly of the saints. Every village had its saint day. And there the villagers would um, dance and feast for four days, continuously dancing these incredible bluesy tunes like no other music you've ever heard, the, the Iperian music. Um, the panieries were a place of great ecstatic, trance-inducing behavior. And bless you. And they would um, they would go into this into an absolute kind of state of uh, of of uh, overwhelm and confess their ills, purge their ills. And all the while, the musicians who would, in more recent times, play with violins and and clarinets, um, would imitate the nightingale, and bringing that sense of calmness from the land into the villages and uh, into these ceremonies as a way of calming the people. Um, you can still hear those recordings made at the dawn of, uh, of, of uh, the recording industry from Greek musicians playing these old nightingale songs. And so the, the, the oral tradition has passed down um, huge troves of nightingale songs still to this day in, in Russian telling of soldiers being wooed by the nightingales to not to go into war, but to be, become romantics. Um, oh, if only they could work their power today. And, uh, and indeed, in England, we have the nightingale as the second most common bird featuring in our folk songs. And who knows what the first bird is? I heard it. There's the blackbird. You're right. Bottle of whiskey or something for that person over there. Um, please. <laughs> um, I'm going to teach you a little French lullaby that maybe those of us who've managed to stick it out right to the end will get to sing um, at closure, at closing time. And this is a, a tiny little French round um, that goes with the words, Bonsoir, bonsoir, la brume est montée du sol, the mist rises from the ground, on entend le rossignol, listen to the nightingale, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Can I teach it to you? It goes like this. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Those two together. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. La brume est montée du sol. La brume est montée du sol. 
en entendre le Rossignol, en entendre le Rossignol, la brume est montée du sol, la brume est montée du sol, en entendre le Rossignol. On entend le rossignol. The last part goes. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Together. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. I'm going to pitch it up a little bit. Let's do that together. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. La brume est montée du sol together. On entend le rossignol. La brume est montée du sol. On entend le rossignol. Bonsoir. 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 La brume est montée du sol. On entend le rossignol. La brume est montée du sol. On entend le rossignol. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, hold that inside you. Um, we're going to take a short break very soon, and uh, we have a couple more things on my list here to do and tell you about. Um, we have a treat coming up for you, and this is my uh, this is my notice to the wonderful team, the Nest Collective team, who are doing an amazing job in variable conditions uh, to look after you all. But we have a little hot drink to pass around. And this hot drink, which we're going to do at the interval, and um, is a drink made of goose grass or sticky willy. Many of you might know it, bane of gardeners, but the uh, absolute sort of the highest herbal uh, elixir for you herbalists and natural tea drinkers. Very rich in uh, immuno supports, and um, and I've picked some goose grass uh, yesterday when we were down with the nightingales. We're going to listen to. I picked this goose grass from around the, the bush where they were, where they're living. And so this goose grass, in the few weeks that it's been growing, or, or a week or two it's been growing, has been sung to every night by nightingales. It's full of nightingale goodness. And I picked it especially, and I brought it here uh, to Deptford for you guys. And we've been brewing it in the first half, and we're going to pour it in little, um, little cups. And you used to, in the olden days, we used to have a big kind of like jug and everyone would take a sip and pass it around. We're not allowed to do that anymore. It's so boring. We used to come out of these concerts and we were all either going to go really ill or we had really strong immunity. Now we'd all just die. And so we're not allowed. We've, it, finally, we've caved into American style hygienics, so hy hygienism. So sorry, you'll get your own little cup. And so please make sure you get one. Have a drink the nightingale. Get that warmth and goodness inside you. And that will hopefully bring us good fortune. Um, but we have to find out whether our link up is going to work. So uh, before we do this, I'm going to get my mobile phone, uh, which all of this depends on. And I'm going to phone our nightingale wrangler, Tiff, in the field. I'm going to plug it in. Where it is, it's got crap reception. So this might, you know, we might end the first half on a real, like, failed moment. Uh, but we're going to phone in Tiff, and hopefully he'll, he'll answer and just tell a little bit, like, about where he is and what's going on down there. And you've all got to say hello to Tiff, because he's doing this uh, on his own, in, a, in the dark. I know, you thought your plight was, your, you were suffering hardship. It's got it even worse. Hello. Oh. Can you hear that, Tiff? 
you've got hundreds of Londoners here who are cheering at you. <laughs> yes. Can you hear that? Tiff, are you there? Hello, hello. Oh, no. Oh, shit. That wasn't loud enough, guys. Maybe I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to WhatsApp him. Should we do that? That's, that's height of technology. Um, I just have to find him on my phone. Hold on. I should have got this prepared earlier. Here we are. Okay. Try again. Please answer, Tiff. Please answer. Hello. Tiff, can you hear Hello. us? Hello. I can hear you. Can you Yay. hear me? <laughs> Is he loud enough? Hello. Can we have a bit more Tiff in the front here? How's it going, Tiff? It's going okay. It's going okay. How are you guys? He's, with you. <laughs> He's whispering because he doesn't want to like disturb the night here. We are, we're really warm. It's quite balmy here in South London. Um, we've got an amazing view of Canary Wharf and, uh, and the River Thames. Um, t tell us about where you are right now. Well, I'm standing on the edge of the field, looking down towards the train tracks. And it's quite overcast here. Not a star to be seen yet. But that means that it's mercifully balmy. It's not as chilly as it has been other nights. So I'm layered up. I'm probably the most layered up of, of us all. Oh, you and think it's so? Very still. <laughs> um, very still here. The trees did, are barely moving in the forest behind me. So dis oh. Describe the land, just so we get yeah. a, an idea of where the nightingales that we're going to hear are and what what it feels like there. So, but to to my back we have a beautiful ancient woodland that is largely composed of hornbeam and oak with the wood anemones just handing over to the bluebells and in front of me the fields drop down slowly towards an old abandoned railway track which is thick with dense thorny scrub of blackthorn where our prized singers will be lingering this evening and hopefully warming up their vocal cords for us a bit later. But right now it's very, very still. And uh, yeah, it's, it's looking like it's gonna be a beautiful night. <gasps> yes, great. Um, so Tiff, the plan is to just to reconfirm with you and let these guys know that we are, we do know what we're doing. Um, we're just gonna, Excellent. we're gonna have a little break now, but then afterwards I'm just gonna carry on wittering nightingale chat and singing songs with these lovely musicians until such time as you hear the birds and then you've got to phone phone us is that right i will call i will call in the birds when they when they call us when right. they call us I call, i'll call you and then i'll i'll beam it in via the black box to tom and and then you'll have it all around you just like I do here. So that's Tom over there and Axel who are in charge of the, the, the production. Say hi to Tom and Axel. Yay. We've got to show them the love <laughs> too. Um, and so Tiff, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my phone on silent and, and I, I, I'm watching it and I've told my mother not to phone me tonight. I have a very important <laughs> business. She probably will knowing her. Um, why isn't she here, mother? Um, so Tiff, you're you're on speed dial, um, and when okay. you phone I'll us, I'll be I'll be mother this evening, Sam. Okay, you'll look after us. All right, and you're going to guarantee us Nightingale, right? Absolutely. All, all money guarantee back, right? It. Yeah. Money back. <laughs> all right, Tiff. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have we're gonna eat some drink some goose grass tea from where you are. So. Oh, lovely! Very okay. lovely. Thank I'll be you. having my own goose goose truck grass tea here on the field edge. Good for you. All right. Well, we're going to say goodbye to you for now, and we're going to have a little break ourselves. So thank you, Tiff. See you later. Speak to you soon. Bye, everyone. <laughs> okay. That's brilliant. So that concludes our first half. Um, you've done very well. I think it's going okay. Um, for you... <laughs> Uh, well, uh, for you viewers at home, just to say where wherever you are, please do type in the chat 
where you're beaming in from. You've now got a wonderful little half an hour and 50 seconds uh, montage of wonderful bits of music, special stuff that's being made just for you. And so you don't have to miss out on uh, the entertainment. And we're just going to get round the fire and drink hot tea and get soup and stuff like that. So um, thank you all. See you very soon. Hey there, everyone, and I uh, hope you're enjoying the show so far. Uh, for you online viewers, uh, just to say that uh, the in-person audience are having some drinks, stretching their legs. Uh, for you guys who don't get that uh, bar availability and all that, uh, we thought we'd give you something special to watch. And so we've got some uh, videos and exclusive stuff just for you for the next 30 minutes or so, including uh, coming up a very exclusive film that's new release from Ruby Collie, one of the wonderful musicians we're working with and will be with the Nightingales later in the season. But I thought I'd also take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about who we, the Nest Collective, are. We've been running for about 17 years. I founded it back in 2005 and um, it's been running all that time bringing music and nature and community and traditions all together in extraordinary places and in extraordinary ways we do all sorts of things from the Sing with Nightingales online broadcasts to the in forest events that are going on right now which there are a few tickets left to go actually hear Nightingales with myself and a guest musician in intimate 35 people only a night. Uh, check the website out for that but we also have a whole summer ahead uh, of campfire clubs happening in six cities across the country mostly in London but also up in Manchester, Coventry, Bristol, Brighton um, and Sheffield too. Um, we have our Magpies Nest festivals twice a year London and also in Bristol this year. We have nature walks and pilgrimages, one in Scotland, one down in Sussex and so many other things. We do residences for musicians and all sorts of ways of bringing communities together in celebration of each other, of nature, of music. If you'd like to be part of it, please do uh, sign up for our mailing list, go onto our website, thenestcollective.co.uk or follow us on social media at Nest Folk. Um, and you can just keep up to date with all the wonderful things we get to do and unusual ways that we do it. Um, we've, uh, we do loads of things online as well. So you can check out our YouTube channel to see all the uh, previous Earth Day broadcasts with Nightingales and all sorts of other uh, material that we get to make and do. Um, we hope you're enjoying the show. Thanks very much for sticking with us uh, and for all your support. Please do share this and get other people and I hope you are finding a nice place to be listening to this broadcast. So thanks for tuning in and see you back here very soon.
Hey, I'm Sam Lee and welcome to the Singing with Nightingales home base, the log cabin here in Sussex, uh, where come next spring we will be welcoming you and your friends to this very fireside. We are in one of the most biodiverse parts of the southeast of England uh, and well looked after woodlands. It's very special here. And the nights will start here in this very spot. We will go for a walk as a group, um, listening and learning about the uh, incredible springtime bird chorus as the evening comes on. We will then retire to the fire where food and drink will be had and cheer. And then come darkness, we will tell stories and sing some songs and go into the deep uh, lore of the nightingale. Um, for this is Nightingale Country and uh, only about half a mile away is some very rare habitat where this unique bird is still living despite um, declining numbers across the southeast of England. So we will spend the first part of darkness um, together here and then come Nightingale singing time, which is usually about 10.30, 11 o'clock, we will gather our bits together, wrap up warm and walk down that path there through the forest with no torches, with uh, no light at all, in complete silence and we will um, travel down to where the birds are singing. And that's where the really magical part of the evening begins. So we will go right into the amazing blackthorn thickets where the nightingales will be, uh, the male birds will be taking up their courtship song and singing up to the sky to lure the females down. And it's this famous song that is so loud and so powerful and unremitting. And we will gather very gently close by to where one of the birds has taken up territory. And myself and the guest musician who will be with us that night will gently start to play music with the bird. And that's where the magic begins for the birds do this extraordinary um, response and improvised uh, dance with us musicians. And we fall into this incredible spell um, created by the bird and, uh, and the music. Um, they are very wonderful, very, very intimate, very uh, meditative experiences. Uh, we finish around half midnight and, um, and this year we will have camping available for all the guests um, who want to come and stay and spend a little bit more of an extended time here in these very woods. So I hope to see you uh, in the next season of Sing with Nightingales and thank you very much for listening.
I often get asked where the Sing with Nightingales idea comes from and what its origin story is and um, it actually has very incredible uh, history to it. Um, what we do is nothing actually that original in this idea of taking musicians out uh, into the forest um, to play music with nightingales. This happens um, in different cultures across the Northern Hemisphere while the nightingales are doing their courtship song. But uh, the UK has a very uh, wonderful um, uh, instance that really uh, suggests the beginning of our love and adoration of birds that's so strong within British culture. And it goes back uh, to 1924 to the first ever live radio broadcast made by the uh, legendary cellist Beatrice Harrison. And that uh, momentous event uh, involved her bringing the microphones out into her back garden and her playing the cello with the nightingale. 90 years after that, uh, I was very lucky to make a Radio 4 documentary, only a short one, 14 minutes long, that you can still hear, uh, called Singing with the Nightingales. And I went to pay homage to Beatrice and that uh, legendary event that really started what is uh, now the kind of commonplace of live streaming and, and broadcasting from anywhere at any time. I went out into the woods just below where we are right now and um, went into the thicket where the nightingales live, as I've done many times to listen to the birds, and I went with some musicians and this time, instead of just listening to the nightingales, I sang an old folk song with the bird. And what I wasn't expecting was the response that I received from the bird, connecting in with the music and with the violins and the cellos that I was with. So this incredible um, call and response emerged and an obvious awareness that this bird had of my musicality, our musicality and vice versa and we went to this into this amazing dance together and it was that moment I had the epiphany that this was an experience that was so powerful connecting in with nature in such an unusual and, uh, and, and deep way that I wanted to share this with audiences so now every spring from mid-April through to the end of the May when the males are singing their courtship song people come are, are invited to this very spot just outside Lewis in Sussex and I take you folks down to these very nightingales uh, where we perform this amazing uh, ritual, this gathering um, and musical conversation with this uh, incredible, unique and now very rare bird. So that's how the Sing with Nightingales came to be. Um, I'd love to see you there uh, next spring and come and be part of that experience. Thank you very much.
kilando silandi molunya akabada kana kuluru la jamole ka kilando no silandi molunya akabada kana ah imada dadu karenteri ke jawia le beno Imada da do karen teri musa hasidi ale benama. Saba menga kilom ni mulu mulu falo ta duna jang mangku jau ke awala. Man saba menga kilom ni mulu mulu falo ta duna jang mangku jau ke awala. Nusa dia ye samba ye samba ah ye samba ye samba. Nusa dia ye samba ye samba. Aye samba, aye samba. No la be mu la la le ti a be beta, a be beta. Vinte tu la. No la be mu la la le ti a be beta, a be beta. Vinte tu. So birds here right now. This is their moment. Um, any names you want to throw out? We've had pheasant, sheep, <laughs> others that you wren. Blackbird. Blackbird, wren. There was a couple of great wrens. Yeah. So Wood good. pigeon. Wood pigeon, yes. <laughs> robin. Uh, and a robin, that was a robin just up here. Wood, the wood pigeon, for those who aren't, I my, my favourite is that it goes, my heart bleeds, Betty. My heart bleeds, Betty. My heart bleeds, Betty. My. <laughs> and they always never, they never complete sentence. So frustrating. Um, <laughs> there are other versions of that, but I always hear my heart. There's the pheasant. Um, so Robin Blackbird. Some of you were listening to the song thrush down there earlier. I saw you, kind of head up, kind of gawping. The song thrush. I can't hear right now. Oh, that's the blackbird over there. That's another blackbird doing the alarm call. That's the other alarm call. So as the, it gets later on, the blackbirds go from their song to that alarm. They're real kind of like easily flustered. <laughs> They're highly dramatic birds. birds. <laughs> and, um, and when they when you walk, you'll see that they'll do this amazing light up. Um, uh, We've had we have green woodpecker here. They've been yak, yaffling away as they do. Yaff, 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 yaff. You'll hear them like laughing, kind of hyena like. The cuckoo is back. He's been circling around. Seen him last night. I heard him for the first time right at the end of our event. He's they sing at night. We also had lapwing have arrived at the, at the fields here. I haven't been seen. <coughs> since 1969 oh, so it's a really and their song i hope they sing tonight the males are doing their mating call totally amazing isn't it Everywhere, 
was floating around the city and I I could see the fairy lights in living rooms and you you had to to see I caught you That I I came all the way here. The orange days are gone. The yellow room has vanished, but I. Hello everyone and welcome back, all you sitting here in the Master Shipwrights Palace in Deptford and all you online at home. Um, I hope you had a nice little rest there, stretch your legs, get the blood going. Um, 
I've just found out that we have got listeners online in some extra. Oh, <laughs> yes, all right. We've got people online. <laughs> We've got one person watching on YouTube. No, we don't. They're all over the joint. They're like nightingales. We've got, um, I'm going to sh shout over to the wonderful uh, team, the Nest Collective team here. Please give a cheer for Seraphine and Orly, Ollie, who are on, on doing the, the technical side. Um, Seraphina, where have we got people coming in from? Where is she? She's not there. She's gone to the uh, Portaloo. Um, well, she told me earlier that we have people in Hong Kong, Venice, Virginia in America, Australia, loads of people in Sussex. And somebody was saying that, oh, Serafina, are you there? Hey, you're welcome. Serafina, ladies and gentlemen. Woohoo! Um, Serafina, where have we got people coming in from? Wow, yay. Um, I feel very international all of a sudden. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you, Serafina. Thank you, all you guys watching from those amazing places. Um, I hope it's warmer wherever you are. Um, so, part two, nothing on my phone just yet from Tiff, but with, I've got it on vibrate and it's in my pocket and we're waiting. Um, and uh, I thought I'd start uh, as we come into this, the kind of the dark night to tell you a little story. I get uh, often asked, how did the nightingale get his voice? Have you ever wondered this? How did he become the finest singer in the whole of the world, better than all other birds and all other species, um, and revered? It's quite a, a, an acclaim. And, um, there's an old Romanian tale that actually explains the whole thing. And so we're going to take us back to a very much older time, a time way before we were even in our hairy ape stage when the land was ruled by just birds. And the land was filled with our feathered friends um, that filled the trees. And the trees stretched for as far as the eye could see. And then further to the furthest stretches of this island, and then onto the mainland, it was just forest as far as one could walk many a year. And the birds lived in one big community, speaking from species to species, as they still do today. But in those times, they weren't like they are today, full of different colors and motifs and textures and patterns and eyes like the peacock and flashes of color like the mallard. They were all brown. They hadn't evolved to, to develop colors. They weren't necessary, though they thought. But it became rather problematic around times like this, when the mating season started and the birds had to go and find a mate to make sure their kin were born and their genes were passed down to generations ahead. But it was rather difficult because they couldn't tell one species from the other because they were all just brown birds. And it caused many an awkward moment where one species would start flirting with another and realize their mistake. And so the birds decided that something had to be done about this situation. So the conference of the birds was called, as was often the case when big problems fell upon the avian kind. And all the birds of the forest gathered in their ritual clearing, came into one big circle to discuss the problem. How are we going to solve this issue? And they talked the afternoon through and no problem no solution was found and they talked again through the night and still no solution was found and eventually they realized this was beyond their capability of solving they had to take this problem to a high level they had to go and seek the advice from god and so the plans were made that all the birds were to visit god and the time was assigned, and at that moment, all the birds flew to the highest 
hill upon which stood the highest tree. And from the top of that highest tree, they flung themselves off that hip, high up towards the clouds, as high as they could fly, and even further through the damp mistiness of the first layer of cumulonimbus clouds. Higher still, where the air got thin and wispy, full of ice crystals. And they beat their wings faster and faster until eventually they broke through the atmosphere into that realm that has no name. But that is where God dwells. And eventually they landed at God's front door and they all gathered up in front of this big wooden door and knocked upon the door. And there it opened and God stood in front of the birds. And she says to the birds, Come in. I know why you're here. Lovely to see you all. Come into my home. And she led them through this rather splendid home God has. Uh, very high ceilings, big Georgian style windows. And they came through the, 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 the front door and into the sort of uh, the sitting room and beyond through the very large kitchen with all the facilities and into the workshop right at the back of the house. Big skylight, great light. And that's where God did all her her work, the good work. She goes, I have a solution for you, birds. Come here. And she opened her cupboards and pulled out an enormous box of paints. God takes the paintbrushes from out the pot, and really nice hog, hog hair paintbrushes, very expensive ones. And she laid out her palette and one by one the birds came up. She took the colours and she painted each bird, the kingfisher, flashes of iridescent green and blue and orange. The pheasant, exceedingly expensive bird to paint. Um, the peacock, even more fantastical and wondrous. She really like let her imagination go wild on the peacock. The blue tit, the robin with his red breast. They all got their new suit. And one by one, proud with their new attire, the birds left God's house and off the front doorstep fell to earth, floating down back through the sky to the forest floor. All the birds, except one. Nightingale is a very shy bird. He was feeling a little bit awkward about going up to God and asking for his suit of colours and in the doing so, didn't get seen. And by the time he plucked up the courage to say, hi oh God, can, can I have some color? She'd run out of paint. And this absolutely broke Nightingale's heart. He didn't want to say a little brown bird for the rest of his days. He pleaded with God, please just look a little bit further. Maybe there's a little something left in the tubes. So she poured through her box and squeezed and squeezed and nothing was there in all but one tube, a tiny little speck of something down the bottom. So she took her finest tooth, not toothbrush, paintbrush, and she poked it down and swirled and swirled. And pulled one little globule of gold paint. So she looks at this paintbrush and says, I can't really do very much. It's, it's kind of wasted if I just try and paint it on you. I have a much better idea. The Nightingale looked up. He was desperate. He'd have anything right now. And she says to Nightingale, Nightingale, open your mouth. And so he did. He parted his beak. And she took the paintbrush. And she took that little gold speck put it down his throat and swirled it around and said, Nightingale, I'm going to give you a golden voice. And so Nightingale was exceptionally pleased about this, closed his mouth, little swallow, and off he went to the front door step and threw himself off God's porch on his way down and down. 
until suddenly he met an enormous thundercloud rising up from the earth. This big storm had started to brew, powered by the moist wetness coming off the forest below. And Nightingale got caught in an updraft, sucked into this big terrifying thunderstorm and was tossed about, thrown in an updraft, smashed down in a downdraft, hit by loads of ice crystals and hailstones, and hither and whither he was thrown about, until eventually he was spat out in a cloudburst. Down he fell to the forest floor, cold and frozen, he hit a little mossy patch and lay there, bruised, been in pretty good shape. He shakes himself off, flies up onto the nearest branch and realizes it's, it's come night time. And by this time, what was happening in the forest is what had happened for all the years before that all the birds were singing in great wild chorus. It was absolute no rhyme or reason, no melody or harmony. It was just cacophony not like what we were hearing earlier. It was an absolute din. And this was Nightingale's time to join in on the din as they did. And so he flew back to his perch, found where he lived, stood on his little spray and opened his voice. And out came the most beautiful song that had ever been heard on earth. And as his song stretched through the forest and was heard by all the other birds. A silence fell upon the woods, just allowing Nightingale's song to pierce through. Never had a song been heard quite as beautiful as this. What had happened to our friend Nightingale, they all asked. And so once again, the birds gathered into a conference to decide what was to be done. They couldn't just sing their din every night, smothering Nightingale. This was too special a song. And so the birds came to an agreement. That was that they would sing loudly before the night and loudly at the end of night. But through the darkness, this was Nightingale's time. However, when this went to contract, it became very problematic with birds like owls and nightjars that became very upset with this and, and put their foot down and uh, didn't agree. So there was a few little sub-clauses and some small print allowing them certain amounts of contribution. And thus we still have owls and nightjars and a few other, you know, dunnocks squirting this song here and there, but nothing, nothing quite like Nightingale. And still to this day, this is when the nightingale sings at night his night song. And still to this day, if you are able to find yourself in just that right spot to see a nightingale singing and to be able to look down his throat, you'll see a shimmering gold. And that is how nightingale got his song. And if you believe that, <laughs> you're a true human. Um, the nightingale has about 12,000 different sounds they can create. That some of the more mature males can sing about 250 different phrases and they will constantly improvise on each phrase. So they'll never sing the same song twice. And they have this extraordinary way of playing that is of on and off. They sing their blast, their little motif in jazz-like improvised fashion. And then the decoration that that is of silence. We allow the, the night to reign and then back on again, creating this amazing polarities. And this has been the enchanting song for thousands of years. And in that silence is where so much wonder and enchantment exists in our species, into what they mean, what they're trying to say, and, and in some ways reflections upon our own emotional states, as we see in the great poets and lyricists who've written 
over the millennia about Nightingale. And I'm going to hand over now to the wonderful Anna Phoebe, who's going to play us a couple of very special pieces of music. So, Anna, thank you. Hello. Thank you, Sam. Well, I have to say, um, I hadn't heard Nightingale's song in real life until last night I joined Sam in East Sussex, and it was just an incredible, incredible, magical, and very humbling experience going through the forest in silence. And then you realize how creaky your clothes are when you're walking in complete silence. And then we got to the edge where you heard Tiff, the edge of, the, um, the edge of this, this field, and you can see the trees in the distance. And there were so many shooting stars, and it was absolutely just the most incredible night and hearing the nightingale sing. So I'm really excited to do it for a second time tonight here with Canary Wharf in the distance. Totally different, but just as magical. Um, I'm just going to play two very short pieces. The first one in honor of Beatrice is going to be Danny Boy. And then I'm going to play um, an uh, instrumental arrangement of a Ukrainian folk song. It's not about a nightingale, but it's about a duck. And a duck in Ukrainian folklore, crossing water is a, a sign of, of grief and loss, and it's a lament. So I just thought I'd um, honor what's going on outside in the world as well as what's going on here tonight by playing these two very short pieces. Thank you, Anna. 
really beautiful. And in many ways, I'm, I'm pleased you bring in the kind of theme of, of grief in this, because although this is a celebration of the Nightingale, and here on Earth Day, on the 52nd year of Earth Day, in many ways, it's a time to acknowledge that 50 years of campaigning to protect the Earth and all the species upon it, like the nightingales and all the other birds and beasts, um, we're not winning. And we are in a situation where nightingales, although they're singing right now, we expect with the rate of decline that they are going through the year on year, not just incremental, but extraordinary loss of numbers that within 30 to 40 years, they will have gone extinct from this country. That we are the last generation to really appreciate this song in our land. There are about five and a half thousand pairs, we reckon, and there's an extraordinary rate of decline. So many parts of the country, which is from Lincolnshire, as far north down to, um, yeah, there, their heartlands in Essex, Suffolk, Kent, Sussex, um, and a little bit in Surrey, a little bit in Hampshire, even less in Dorset, almost functionally extinct in, in, in Devon. Um, a few hanging on in Gloucestershire, that they are disappearing. And they are indeed, a, in many ways, the canaries in the mine for what's really going on. Their numbers are, are being decimated by many things, the habitat loss, particularly through the explosion in deer populations because they're not being predated anymore and we're certainly not eating enough wild venison. Um, but also the crashing numbers of insects um, due to pesticide use. And the cutting back of the, the removal of the sort of habitat that they like for, for progress, for development, for more agriculture. Uh, their space in nature is not being protected enough. But really, the, uh, the issue that is going to be affecting them more than all of these combined things happening here is the fact that their wintering grounds in Sierra Leone and Senegal and Guinea-Bissau in sub-Saharan Africa, with rapid climate change happening and, and global heating, is going to become inhospitable very soon. And we're going to see not just an incremental loss, but most likely a sudden drop in numbers as hundreds do not return to their usual spots. Um, this is the reality we face with nightingales and so many other of our migrant species. Um, they are foretelling what is going to happen to us. And this is a concept, the singing with nightingales idea, bringing the nightingales into your homes, you know, bringing people to the land to listen to them, is in many ways a gesture of rebellion. It's uh, an act of defiance against this, that in this palliative care that we're trying to do, in, in this rather terminal diagnosis, with the lack of action that's going on societally and governmentally here and abroad, that we have to do what we can to pay them our respect, show them our love and appreciation for the impact they've had upon our ancestors all these years back. Um, that as we lose them, we must grieve them, but we must al also celebrate them. And in our older ages, we will tell what that song was like to listen to um, so that they may not be forgotten. So that's what this is. It's a celebration, but it's also a ritual of grief and acknowledgement of what we're doing to our land. So thank you for giving your love and your appreciation. And please spread that. Go and listen to Nightingales wherever you can find them. Go out into the night, springtime, wrapped very well. And love nature as, as hard as you possibly can for while you can, because it's not a guarantee that it'll be there forever. I'd like to sing a, a song. I'm not having the buzz yet of my phone, but it's coming up time, I'm sure. Um, a song that tells all of this from an ancient perspective. And it's not of the nightingale, it's the song of the turtle dove. Uh, the, the, the bird that is, we expect to first go extinct of all our birds in this country. Many successful reintroductions, the storks are back after 600 years. 
we have all sorts of species that are starting to return. Beavers have arrived in the M25, finally. <laughs> Hooray! You know, we're living incredible, seeing incredible sights in our lifetime of regeneration and success and extraordinary work that our communities are doing. But the turtle dove is one that's really struggling for complex reasons. And although they were a common song for hundreds of years, this old folk song, first collected by um, Vaughan Williams in Sussex, in Ruspa, um, tells almost kind of foretelling of their demise and the disappearance of this bird and indeed climatic change. We hear the rocks melting to the sun, the billows and the hills on fire and the disappearance of the turtle dove. So somehow our ancients knew of what was to come and this is a song they have passed to us. This is called Turtle Dove. little turtle dove sitting under the mulberry tree see how that she does mourn for her true love as I shall mourn for thee As I shall mourn for thee. O oh, fare thee well, my little turtle dove. And fare thee well for a while. For though you go, you'll surely return. If you go ten thousand miles, my love, if you go ten thousand miles, ten thousand miles is very far away for you to return. You'll leave me here to lament and wail a day. My tears you will not see, my love. My tears you will not see. For the crow that's black, my little turtle dove. Change is white. If I prove false to the songbird that I love, the noonday shall sound as night, my love, and the noonday shall sound as night. For the hill shall fall. My little turtle dove, and the roaring billows burn. If I prove false to the mother that I love, I a traitor turn, my love, or I a traitor turn. Thank you. 
fold my little turtle dove and the rocks melt with the sun if my poor heart shall suffer me to fail for I all these things be done my love, till all these be done. Sussex, and I'm hoping we can bring you some song. Um, but while I'm getting this ready, just to say um, thank you very much for coming, because we're going to go into a, a different, more silent listening place right now. Um, for you listeners at home, when we have Nightingale, we're going to go on to a pre-recorded stills. You're not going to see us on stage anymore. And we are going to, um, we're going to go and start to dim the lights here to go into complete darkness if we can. And then we'll get to listen properly. Um, so thank you all. Thank you at home for watching, for your support. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our Nest Collective team. We've done an amazing job. And all the volunteers and helpers. Thank you to the Shipwrights House. We'll be back here in June for our festival, the Magpie's Nest. But for now, I think we're going to go into Nightingale time. Um, so here, let me uh, get this going. And can we say thank you to Anna and Harry? Oh, look, he's ringing me. Here we go. Tiff. Hello, Sam. <gasps> Hello, Tiff. Hi. Can you, hear, can you hear me okay? We can. We're whispering just like you. Excellent. What's going on? Have you got nightingales? It's been pretty quiet here for quite a long time, but just a moment ago, we've had nightingale just start warming up so a few blasts a few phrases and then and then a bit of quiet so he's still getting going i think if we give him a few minutes he's going to get into his flow and he'll be singing beautifully okay we can hear the frogs um is that the marsh frogs down down on site well, that's the that's the, the the community choir of marsh frogs <laughs> providing backing <laughs> vocals. I'm actually going to break the spell. Those are pre-recorded frogs. <laughs> we haven't got the transmission going just yet, but there are marsh frogs, and they sound a bit like this. So, Tiff, what we'll do is, do you want to get the box wound up and and rolling, and we're just going to absolutely get ready for nightingales. Lovely. You... All right, I'll I'll beam it into you now in a couple of moments. Thank you so much, Tiff. Okay. Everyone's Good luck, everyone. Here. Have a beautiful time. We will, we will. Bye. Thank you, Tiff.
I spied a young couple, so sweet they did stray. And one was a soldier and a brave grenadier. And the other was a fair maid and a beauty. So and they kissed so sweet and comforting as they clung to each other. They went arm and arm along the road as, as if sister and brother. They went arm and arm along the road till they came to a stream. And they both sat down together, love, to hear the nightingale sing. And then out of his knapsack he drew a fine fiddle and he played us such a merry tune as you ever did hear and he played us such a merry tune made the woods there for to ring 
Ha ka cry the fair maid. Hear the nightingale sing. And they kiss so sweet and comforting as they clung to each other. They went arm and arm along the road like sister and brother. They went arm and arm along the road till they came to a spring. And they both sat down together, love, to hear the nightingale sing.
Whose head does it fall on if we all have to rise? Who has to be the one always standing at the back? Who has to be at the front, taking all the hits with every surprise? to look to the future that is already here who's still looking to the past and who's really living with the fear if we are battling is that enough is that the murder that she wrote
from the acid clouds. Why did some people start and other people stop? Have we really done enough? It's not just time, it looks like we forgot. Do we pray for higher mercies? Do we pray for intervention? Or do we just live in suspense? Suspended agency. It's always plain to see. Or the thing that's around us, every single continent is an island surrounded by pollution that's here it's strange to imagine all of the damage sometimes you got to ask yourself who are the people getting rich off of all of this do they actually sit down to reflect it's so weird going for all these riches but you can't live forever is that the thing that they forgot Are they not positive for their children? Are they not thinking of their children? Do they not care for their children? Or they just want the epitaph to say something, this was a rich mother, something or other. Are we gonna be grateful to them? for such short-sightedness or will we just be sweating buckets without any crops it's such a strange situation the same voices that are shouting now and then those in silence trying to drown them out It's funny how these days power is silent. But as we know, it's not the sounds that are bringing all the violence. It's hard sometimes, but let's remember and look around. Because every single thing that we know and love is not made by these people who are breaking it down. So let's just remember all these things that we love and know. It's not the banks that's making the trees here grow. So let's remember all these things we cherish and adore. We've got to keep fighting like the bird against the wind forevermore.
зробиться поводку, зробит шавельку клянуку, та ще коні как не лоху, мама ищи сорочку. Slowly, slowly, they return to the small woodland, let alone great trees outspreading and a Stout beams upholding weightless grace of song, a blessing on this place. Here stand in waiting, all around us, uprising. Down comings of the day. 
receiving sun and giving shade. Their lives are benefaction and is a benediction. of the living life, patient as stars, they build in air, after tear a timbered choir, stout beams upholding weightless grace of Blessing on this place. They stand in waiting all around us, uprisings of their native ground, and down comings of the distant light. Receiving sun and giving shade, their lives are benefaction and is a benediction.
Mm-hmm. 